Welcome guys to another episode of Emancipated Human. My name is Luis and I have a, today's interview is very special for me. I get to interview a hero of mine, Doug Casey. Aside from all the fantastic accomplishments, uh, you know, such as having a bestseller and traveling all over the world, this guy knows pretty much everything about everything. And, I, you know, as he says, that's part of being a speculator. Um, one of the, like I've read a couple of his books, but one of them that really, really changed uh, a lot of my thinking that opened a lot of doors for me was one of the more recent ones called Totally Incorrect. So at any rate, thank you so much, Doug, for this interview. Well, it's a pleasure, Luis. I'm speaking to you right now from um, my apartment in Buenos Aires, Argentina. That's, that's pretty exciting, and I was going to ask you a little bit about that, too, um, here in a minute. Um, we can go right at it. So tell me something. Why, why are you in Argentina from all places? Like, you've traveled to like a hundred and some places. Why Argentina? Why Latin America? Well, actually, I've traveled to over 145 countries and lived in 10. And um, it was a process of elimination, actually, that uh, brought me to Argentina, um, if I was your age and I wanted to make a lot of money, I would definitely go to Africa. But from the point of view of lifestyle, Africa is a, a non-starter. Um, uh, I love the Orient, uh, but the problem with the Orient is that if you're not a Thai or a Chinese or what have you, uh, you'll never really be part of the society. Uh, Latin America is a lot like the U.S. or Canada from that point of view. It's a, an immigrant society so that uh, you can fit in uh, if you choose to. And uh, I like Argentina's wide open spaces. Uh, I love its culture. Uh, it's the seventh largest country in the world with only 40 million people, and most of them are here around Buenos Aires. Uh, I like BA, but I spend most of my time in a, a little wine-growing town called Cafajate, where we've uh, uh, created a, a uh, community of very rich in amenities and full of free market-oriented people. So we've had this going, going for five or six years now. So, uh, I've been to every country in uh, Latin America many times, actually. And from a cultural and a lifestyle point of view, I'm not endorsing the government down here, which is actually criminally insane. Uh, Argentina is the place to be. The good thing about the government is they really leave you alone. Uh, they treat you as a valuable guest as opposed to a milk cow which is the way I feel in the, when I'm in the U.S. That's, uh, that's pretty important. One of the things, you know, that I've told my wife is that they don't really have the manpower to really enforce all the laws. You know, it may seem really um, rough on paper, but, you know, they, don't, they, they can't enforce that kind of stuff. And, you know, as you said, you know, you have to kind of also make friends with um, a little bit of their problems. So, you know, how to be able to be over and beyond those things. Um, we have a friend in common, Jorge Truco, you know, he's in Argentina and, uh, he translated, um, uh, recently market for Liberty. That's one of your, you know, that's one of the books that you usually tell a lot of people to read. Um, on this, on this per, uh, particular book, do you, do you think that Latin America is a fertile ground, fertile ground for this message? Well, I'm really pleased with, uh, Jorge. We met 10 years ago. And I was explaining anarcho-capitalism to him uh, over a uh, dinner in the town of San Martín de los Andes in the uh, Patagonia region of the country. And um, he was interested in it. He got a copy of the book. He read the book. And just as happened with me, uh, the logic of that book, The Market for Liberty, uh, made him see that anarchism was the ideal way to have a society organized. And um, he then uh, translated it uh, into Spanish. So um, I'm not sure it's going to change the world, world but uh, 
and I'm not religious either, but uh, as a certain religious character once said, let those who have ears hear. And I'm sure that some people will read it, and it will change their way of thinking as it did mine, and for that matter, Jorge's. And I'd like to urge anybody that's reading it right now, uh, that's listening to this right now, to uh, get a copy of it and read it. I, I totally agree. And, you know, taking a little beyond that, um, the Diamond Age, I think, is the one that uh, Jorge was telling me about. And, you know, he was telling me about files and all that stuff. But before we get into files and, you know, we were talking about anarchy, what, like, you know, going to the really basics, what is anarchy and why would you consider yourself an anarchist? Well, I don't believe in coercion. That means that I don't believe in the state as an entity, and I believe that society uh, can and does organize itself far better than any politicians could hope to do so. So anarchy has uh, gotten a bad name for itself uh, because uh, there are people who call themselves anarchists who've been violent. And of course, I suppose you can have violent anarchists just as you can have violent dentists or violent uh, 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 Christians or, or whatever, but it, it's not the essence of the philosophy. Uh, anarchism is a live and let live philosophy. All it, it doesn't it has nothing to do with violence. It has to do with self-rule. A, narchy, uh, anarchy means no rule, which amounts to self-rule. That I, I and, enjoy and, that and, definition. Oh, I know you do. And as society becomes more technologically advanced, it becomes ever more practical uh, as, a, uh, as a possibility for society organizing itself. So, um, but it's surprising how, um, how uh, people react to this uh, concept. Uh, I mean, it actually makes them go crazy. I was in New Orleans uh, uh, earlier this week, and I was uh, I had a one-on-one uh, -on -one debate for an hour with a well-known neocon named Charles Krauthammer, who has a is often on Fox and uh, writes um, editorials for various conservative papers, and he was absolutely incensed at the thought that anybody could actually defend anarchy. That's pretty crazy that they get to that point. You know, like you, some people say anarchy is a pipe dream, that it's utopic. You know, what, what do you say to these people? Well, it, it, it's... <laughs> well, <laughs> what can you say to them? It's, it, it's a long story. You try to... If they're people of goodwill, you try to lead them by the hand and show them that what they think they're afraid of is actually nothing to fear. But um, it's, uh, it's almost a religious issue for uh, a lot of these people. Uh, and like a lot of religion, uh, a fear of anarchy is uh, it's based on a very... Uh, uh, it's based on fear. They're, they're afraid that they're going to be there's going to be chaos and disorder, and there are going to be mobs running through the street. But in point of fact, that's the opposite of anarchy. That's it. You know, like Lao Tse was talking about spontaneous order. It just happens naturally. Um, you know, on, on Marxism, once you said that that was a secular religion, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, the idea of religion being afraid of anarchy. These guys are like... I consider them a little bit crazy you know most of them are nice like you said Pareto's low 80 20 most people are well intended but you know could you like explain us a little bit about secular religion with Marxism how does that connect the dots the dots well most religions worship some type of a uh, uh, being a sky god uh, or Jesus uh, Allah Yahweh something like that uh, secular religions, however, uh, worship the state or something in the here and now in the material world. 
And uh, Marxism uh, is a secular religion. It doesn't worship a pie-in-the-sky God. It's created a, an artificial God in the here and now. So, I, I absolutely agree with that. I posted that on Facebook one time, and you know, a bunch of... Um, I think, and I even said that Marxism and objectivism tend to be kind of, you know, the same deal on secular religions. Would you agree with that? You... Well, I would, because uh, I met Ayn Rand... Uh, not so long before she died, and uh, because I'd said nice things about her in uh, my crisis investing book, uh, I was invited to this party, and I found her personally uh, very warm, very charming. Uh, but um, I went out to dinner with uh, about a dozen of her acolytes, uh, correct term, I would say, <laughs> uh, afterwards. And uh, it turned rather unpleasant because uh, they saw me as being an apostate, uh, a heretic, someone that, uh, uh, like a bunch of sh uh, Sunni Muslims, uh, might feel about a Shia Muslim who's sitting at the table with them. We all say we believe in the same thing, but not quite. And uh, there's nothing that they hate more than a, a heretic. So it really is a religious movement in many ways. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. So I'm, I'm glad that you're able to explain that to us. Um, now, on that, you know, we we were going back to the let's say for society. Do you, um, you know, in the whole book situation with uh, Market for Liberty, do you think that you know me being 31 years old, you know, um, okay, first of all, a lot of people say that your ideas are pretty radical, you know. For me, at my age, I think that your ideas are right on. I don't see them radical at all. Now, with that thought, do you think that the younger generation armed with technology can be uh, important to uh, achieving a laissez-faire society? Well, I have high hopes for the upcoming generation because when I was in my 20s and 30s, um, you couldn't find another libertarian. You'd have to go out of your way to find them. But uh, now you see them on television, radio, on YouTube. So uh, I think my generation, believe it or not, has effectively passed the torch. And uh, I'm very pessimistic about the direction the world is going because all of the states in the world are being, well, since they're bankrupt, they're becoming much more grasping. I mean, the, uh, uh, the prime directive of all living organisms is survive. And the way the state survives, of course, is to extract uh, wealth from society. So they're becoming much more aggressive than they've ever been in the past. So, uh, but in the face of, uh, you know, this very sorry megatrend, um, with the state becoming more powerful and more desperate, at the same time, there are a lot of uh, younger people that have recognized anarchism and uh, anarcho-capitalism and libertarianism. Uh, a lot of that is perhaps due to Ron Paul, uh, who introduced a lot of people to this concept. So there's cause for optimism within the uh, this pessimistic environment. But I'm afraid that we may be genetic mutants and we're outnumbered, uh, <laughs> you know, like 50 to 1 by the collectivists. I've always liked that, um, you know, thing that you just said, we're just, you know, the X-Men, we're mutants, we're pretty, I don't know, that's like a mistake of nature that we happen to be like this. And, you know, I happened, uh, I went to the uh, Conscious Capitalism uh, Summit uh, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, and the CEO of Whole Foods, John Mackey, said that he's basically given up on his generation. You know, he's trying to focus on, like you said, you know, younger generation trying to get these ideas across because, like, you know, the hippies of the past became the UPs of the now that, are, you know, are kind of uh, looking forward to that social security check that I'm not going to get. So I'm not really looking forward to that. And, you know, like trying to find avenues, agorism, counter economics, you know. Staying, you know, um, off radar and just doing your own thing, kind of stuff. 
So I, I, I appreciate your perspective there. So, you know, that takes me to the, the files from the Diamond Age. Is that kind of what you're talking about when you talk about us doing that kind of thing? Well, yes, it is, because I find that I don't have a lot of resonance with what are called my countrymen, my fellow Americans. In fact, most of my fellow Americans are active dangers to me. They're, they're actually enemies of me. They're parasites leeching on me. I have more in common with libertarians that I know in Argentina or the Congo or Vietnam than I do with my fellow Americans. So I consider uh, my country to be wherever freedom is and my country, country men uh, to be whoever uh, I see the world the same way as. So it's got nothing to do with these uh, silly nation states with their completely arbitrary lines drawn on maps. I mean, I disregard them whenever I possibly can. Oh, yeah, I, I do too. And it's kind of silly, you know, like to have to ask permission to our overlords to get a passport so you can get out and go to another place. So, you know, like... Oh, it's, 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 it's actually degrading. I mean, I'm, I'm embarrassed at the thought that, uh, that most people actually take these government ideas and the orders that they're given by these uh, automaton-like bureaucrats uh, seriously. It's, uh, it's, it's really disgusting and, and degrading, like I said. And, you know, like, you travel a lot, so you'll, you'll attest to this as well. You know, when I go out to visit my family in Mexico and then I come back, you know, the waiting line for a U.S. citizen or resident, you know, they treat you like cattle, like you said. So um, that, that's pretty, pretty degrading. And you mentioned something interesting some, a while back. You know, we're, we're, seeing, we're being seen as milk cows but we're going to be seen as beef cows. What do you mean by that? Well, right now we are being treated as milk cows, but uh, just as a farmer may uh, treat his dairy cows as beef cows, if the necessity arises, uh, the state feels that way about us too, because we're really nothing but state property. So um, this is why it's critical for everybody to uh, diversify themselves so that uh, if the going gets tough in the United States, uh, as it has in dozens of countries in the last hundred years, uh, you've got some place that you can go. Uh, because the type of criminals that, that uh, get involved in governments they're pretty much the same across uh, space and time. So there's no guarantee that what's happened in places like Germany and Russia, or for that matter, Rwanda, uh, or Zimbabwe, or Cambodia, won't happen in the U.S. In, in fact, I expect it will, looking at the trend of what's going on in the U.S. at this point. So I feel much freer uh, when I'm outside of the U.S. Uh, and that's where I spend most of my time these days, frankly. And I agree. I uh, finally uh, was able to persuade my wife for us to be able to, you know, diversify geographically. So we'll probably, you know, maybe be kind of neighbors with you sometime soon. So that's pretty exciting. Um, Moving to another direction, um, you know, I, you, from all people, you were the one that um, opened my eyes to Discordianism. And then I became friends with, uh, you know, the former chairman of the Libertarian Party in Utah, which is uh, one of the leading figures of Discordianism here in, in the U.S. How did you get to Discordianism? Uh, let me see. There was a book written by a guy named Kerry Thornley. And I got, was introduced to that through a book that was written by Robert Anton Wilson and Robert Shea, and it was called, it was a trilogy. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Uh, in any event, uh, 
there's a discussion of uh, of that word uh, in the book by Shea and Wilson, and uh, basically, uh, discordianism. In other words, my personal pilgrim's process, a uh, pr- progress philosophically, was when I was a little kid. Uh, I started out as a, a liberal. I, I was thinking like a little kid, which is the way I see liberals. And then I read Goldwater's uh, Conscience of a Conservative, which was quite a good book for what it was uh, when Goldwater was running for president. Uh, and I became a conservative. Then I read Rand's uh, Virtue of Selfishness, and I became an anarchist. Uh, excuse me, a, a I became a, um, uh, an objectivist for a while because uh, it, it did make uh, sense within its own context. Um, uh, then I read The Market for Liberty, and it was clear to me I hadn't thought this out clearly enough, and I became an anarchist. But the next step was actually when I read that Shea Wilson book. What the heck was the name of that? Is it the the Illuminati trilogy or something? Perhaps that's what it was. And they introduced me to this this strange concept of discordianism, where it seems, as I remember anyway, that uh, the whole of the law shall be do as thou wilt. But, very important, be prepared to accept the consequences. And I like that. Because I'm a great believer in taking personal responsibility for your own life and what you do. And in point of fact, everybody does do whatever they want. And, uh, but what they forget about is, is so everybody does that anyway. But uh, the name of the tune is to be prepared to accept the consequences for what you do, not to blame your parents or blame your church or blame your government or blame somebody else. I mean, you've got one life and you live it, so um, that's, uh, that's what discordianism is all about. I absolutely like want, that. But, but be prepared to accept the consequences. It makes me think, you know, that the universe is all about economics, you know? And you kind of uh, also mentioned that too. Yeah, there's you do things, but you have to pay for it. It's like a boomerang. It comes back at you. Um, yes. You know, and another thing that, you know, we were emailing back and forth for, you know, a few weeks to be able to get this. And one of the questions I sent you in the email was about, um, you know, shamanism and ayahuasca and all that stuff. Have you ever taken any of those things? Uh, not as much as some people in my generation have. But um, we were talking before we started this little interview uh, about what I was doing when you rang me. And uh, I mentioned that even as we spoke, uh, I was working on uh, a novel. I think that, uh, as Ayn Rand proved, uh, there's a much bigger uh, potential market to introduce people to ideas through fiction the nonfiction, mm. because fiction is entertaining. Uh, you don't feel like you're being lectured to. So uh, I'm in process of writing a series, actually six, a sextet of uh, novels. And uh, with my um, co-author, uh, I, know, I recognize my limitations, so uh, I'm working with a... Uh, a doctor named John Hunt who wants to be a novelist, like a lot of doctors, uh, he doesn't want to be a doctor anymore. Uh, it's, it's almost more trouble than it's worth. Yeah. So in any event, he's built the Christmas tree and I'm hanging it, hanging lots of ornaments on it. And um, uh, in the first novel, uh, in, uh, what I'm doing in, all, in these novels is I'm taking six unjustly besmirched and highly politically incorrect occupations and reforming their reputations and in the process showing people how you can engage in them from a technical point of view and uh, defending the morality of doing so. The first one is 
speculator. This is something I know about, and I'm almost through with this one now. Uh, in the second one, our hero, uh, who has all his money stolen by the government, uh, wants his money back, so he becomes a drug lord. And here we <laughs> explore the drug business. And now they steal his money again and put him in jail. So he's kind of a pissed off guy, uh, even though he's mellow. I mean, you can piss anybody off. So the third book is called Assassin. And the next book is called Terrorist, a hot potato, uh, where we I've got a lot of thoughts on uh, terrorism and how it works. And, um, but he doesn't believe, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a guy that doesn't believe in initiating force. And uh, uh, his idea of terrorism is something that has no collateral damage. Uh, one of the things that gives terrorism, which is really just a method of warfare, no different than artillery barrages or cavalry charges, for that matter. It's just a method. Uh, he doesn't uh, believe in causing collateral damage. And uh, anyway, from terrorism, he moves back to Africa, where the first one takes place and becomes a warlord, where we show a warlord can be a good guy. And after that, and he reforms this country. This is my hobby, as you may know, uh, going around to worthless third world countries and trying to uh, convince the guy running it uh, that uh, we can turn it into a s Hong Kong on steroids. So anyway, it leads up to the sixth and perhaps final novel, which is called Antichrist, where I can indulge myself on my views on religion. Wow. So anyway, a million words are written on all these things. I've just got to perfect it and make them um, pleasant and interesting to read. I am so looking forward to buying them. Are you going to have them also on ebooks? Uh, oh, yes. And I think the first one's going to be out early next year. So uh, I, I think they'll all be good reads. And I'll let you know when, uh, when the first one, Speculator, is out. Yeah, that would be awesome. Maybe whenever you get it, you can send me a link so we can publish it on you know, my website and a couple of other Facebook pages I have. That will be pretty exciting. So, Well, most novels, as you know, sink without a trace. They sink like a stone. There's a, a million of the things published every year. So I'm hoping this is going to be Harry Potter for philosophically inclined adults. But uh, proof will be in the pudding, obviously. I love that idea, and it's so exciting. You know, you mentioned you like going and doing, uh, you know, trying to convince all these guys. Is that like, you know, do you do that often, or how does that work? Well, I've been to about 10 countries where I've sat down with the guy that runs the place. Uh, the best candidates are places that are run by military, military dictators because they can pretty much do what they want. Uh, I haven't had any luck so far, although I've got to say I've come pretty close and uh, had lots of uh, great material for cocktail parties in the process. The next place I go is very likely to be Mauritania uh, in West Africa, which is perhaps not the wisest choice <laughs> the place to go today, but... Um, in it, interesting place. It's the last place in the world uh, that, um, that uh, illegalized slavery. Slavery was only uh, illegalized there about 20 years ago, believe it or not. Wow. So it's a little bit behind the power curve. That is pretty crazy. So, you know, talking about cocktails and stories, are you going to try to go to an Arcapulco at uh, Berwick's uh, festival in Mexico? I'd like to, but you just can't be everywhere at once, unfortunately. So, um, no, I, I regret that I'm going to have to give that a pass. Okay, okay, well, I guess just... I'm, going to, be, I'm going to be down here in Argentina at that point. And, uh, you know, once I'm here, uh, I like to hang out because, you know, the place that we built up in northwest Argentina, I've got a uh, fantastic world-class gymnasium and spa. I've got um, my horses. I've got 
a great climate. I've got interesting people to hang out with. So, um, no, I, it's hard to pull me away from there during the winter, the northern winter. Yeah, and that will be your summertime, so it will be wonderful in La Estancia de Cafayate. That's pretty cool. Uh, my last question, and this is kind of a silly question. You know, I, I, I heard that you went on a treasure hunt once. Where did you go, and how did you end up there? Ah, yes. Uh, back in 1971, well, I, I've been a scuba diver my whole life. Awesome. And um, uh, all scuba divers like to do wreck diving, preferably treasure diving. So uh, there was an expedition that was organized as a commercial venture uh, to dive on sunken Spanish wrecks uh, in the the Quito Sueño banks, which are off the coast of Colombia. And uh, we had this uh, uh, old minesweeper, like the one that Jacques Cousteau had, yeah. except ours looked more like a target drone than Jacques Cousteau's boat. <laughs> so anyway, uh, a bunch of us paid our money and fixed up the boat and uh, did some diving on it, uh, quite a bit of diving actually, but um, it all came to naught. Well, that's a bummer. That's a bummer. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, you, you, I, I'm glad for the experience. I mean, the money that I spent seemed like a lot at the time. But uh, at this point, uh, I'm glad I spent it because uh, you can always lose money, but they can never take the experience away from you. So uh, one piece of kind of parting advice that I leave to everybody, is if you're thinking about doing something, uh, do it. Because sometimes opportunity doesn't knock twice. And, um, uh, you know, the older you get, the more options that you inevitably close off. So um, go for it, whatever it is. That's a wonderful statement, and I appreciate that. So I'm really grateful for this, and um, you know you're in um, Argentina. You know several months out of a year. How's your Spanish? Uh, I'm not a good linguist, believe it or not. My French is still better than my Spanish, even though I learned it basically in high school and college. The reason for that, of course, is that I learned it when I was in my twenties, and uh, it's easier to pick things up when you're of a certain age than not. So uh, I can certainly communicate well enough with waiters and taxi cab drivers and such, but to uh, carry on a proper conversation, I guess not. Sorry, I'm just, you know, thanking you for this time and um, I'm really grateful for, you know, this interview and um, we'll be looking forward to your books. Thank you. And uh, we'll do this again after the first one is out. Fabulous. We will do that. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thanks, Louis. Same to you. Be well, sir. Bye.